Coming up today, we'll take a look at how some black men are doing their part to save black youth through volunteering as mentors. Also, the bat is back. Jazz musician Alvin Batiste returns to teaching at Southern University in Baton Rouge, and he's better than ever. Mentors and role models on today's edition of Folks. and welcome to folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. Today our focus is on mentors and role models for black youth, particularly black men. When you were growing up, did you sometimes want an adult other than a family member with whom you could just talk? Well, in today's atmosphere of high risk for young blacks, there's more need than ever for mentors. There are fewer black men in teaching and helping professions, though black children, especially boys, need black men to look up to. Today, you'll meet some black men who are doing their part to save black youth, by taking an active role in children's lives through mentoring. Hey, Sergeant to Thomas to Gillette has been on the Baton Rouge Police Force for about 18 years. For the past few months, he's been more involved in the Baton Rouge community through the Big Buddy program. Along with Officer Jackson, Gillette is coaching a Big Buddy athletic team in Cadillac Street Park in the Zion City neighborhood of North Baton Rouge. Well, we found that we could uh, really uh, guide the young men in, in, in in the work ethic uh, part, of, part of athletics, that anything that you uh, do, you have to work for. During the course of the season, we had this summer, our softball in particular, uh, uh, we advised them that we didn't get here just because we're good. We got here because we worked hard at it. And uh, that proved out in many, many ways in certain games that uh, uh, the fact that we worked hard in this hot sun during the summer and, uh, and the benefit us, we, we had our rewards. We won the championship. Well, it's something that I always wanted to do, and um, when I decided to come and do it, I just wanted to come out and do the best that I can. And like I say, it's just something that I always wanted to do, coach kids, so I felt real good about it. We try to also try to tell them, hey, uh, you're not losers. Don't, don't ever think like you're losers. If you work hard and, and dedicate yourself to what you want to do, uh, the rewards of will be forthcoming. And it goes not only in athletics, which is easy, but it's, which appears to be easy. It's not that easy, but in everything, everything else is easy. Athletics, I mean, uh, is hard. Athletics is easy for them. They're, they're naturally gifted athletes. Jackson and Gillette believe that experiencing some success in athletics will prepare these boys for better grades and higher self-esteem. They're also hoping that the discipline will help keep them out of trouble. The benefit is um, the recreation because of this type of community that they live in. This is recreation for the kids that live in this community. In other communities, um, sports like these will be secondary because they have other things to do. I feel that this is recreation for the kids and that they can come out and enjoy themselves and um, play sports and have um, a part of being disciplined and stuff. So I think it's a big benefit for them. We don't try to uh, run them away with, with, the, with, with the hard work that we do with them, no. But uh, if you can stick it out with the hard work, you know, it pays off during the game, you know. This is just one part. And I tell them, go home and study. So I don't have any homework or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah, you got homework. Go home and read a book or something. You know, find something to read. Read the Bible. You know, do something. You know, but you can't read. Taking the out of time away from the kids is basically what benefit I get out of coming out of here. Because if you can take out of time away from a kid, um, that don't give him a whole lot of time to get in trouble. Although we're not out here but maybe two and a half hours, that's enough time to keep them on the ballpark and let them play some little football. And maybe by the time they get home, they'd be too tired to want to go get in trouble. Coaching the athletic team takes several hours a week. If Gillette and Jackson were traditional big buddies, it would only take two hours a week. Yet neither officer would have it any other way. 
They say that coaching gives them more impact on the lives of their team members. Officer Jackson is the strategist, and I'm, I'm the, uh, the taskmaster. I just make sure it gets done. I'm rough on them uh, as far as making them do the calisthenics and exercise and going through the drills and stuff like that. And then uh, hand it over to Officer Jackson. He goes through the, the plays and stuff. They're going to run. We have fun. And some things I see we need to work on uh, to better ourselves. But uh, uh, you have this di different work. Officer Jackson and I hadn't worked together before, but we both want to win. And that's key. We both want to win. And I, I don't know much about the strategy and stuff like that, but I know, do know about conditioning. So I'll get him a condition, and he works with him on the plays and stuff, and he utilizes everybody. So we, we push him real hard, and they respond. The ultimate goal for me would be to have them just have a self-respect for themselves, um, a high self-esteem after they leave off the ballpark. I tell them every day that um, if you can do this sport, if you can play this sport and put up with me for two and a half hours every day, then you can be anything you want in life. You can be successful in anything you want to do because it's not going to get any tougher than this. Both officers believe that it is important for black men to become involved with black youth. Growing up in, in, uh, in a large, much larger city than Baton Rouge, uh, I uh, had a, a, a male that took an interest in me when I was growing up and showed me. He was a good role model for me at the time, and he sort of inspired me to uh, go for it. I used to go to his house and see all his medals and stuff, and, and I said, I'm going to get me that. And I did. I surpassed him, as a matter of fact. I probably went further in athletics than he did, but he's also a professional person now. And uh, every now and then I go back, I call him. He's my big brother, more or less, the big brother I never had. I feel it's important because um, most of the time black men are stereotyped as being um, having low self-esteem and not doing nothing with their life. Um, I think by being a black man, a young black man coming out here and doing something real productive, letting them see that I'm doing something productive with my life, maybe it'll rub off and they'll want to do something productive with them. Now, before we begin the next portion of our program, you may want to grab a pencil and paper. You'll see the location and phone numbers of programs around the state where you can call and volunteer your time to mentor a child. Joining us today is Janola Duke. Janola is Director of Volunteers in Public Schools in Baton Rouge. Jim Geyser, Director of the Big Buddy Program in Baton Rouge. Also, Galen McFarlane, the Activities Coordinator from Big Buddy in Baton Rouge. Welcome to folks. I'm going to start with you, Jim. Uh, a few years ago, when we first looked at the Big Buddy program, uh, we were surprised and a little bit disappointed that the majority of the Big Buddy, or just about all of the Big Buddies, mm -hmm. were white. That's changed somewhat. Tell us how you did it and uh, how you see the future okay. of that shaping up. It's changed in that more publicity has gotten out, more black men have gotten involved, but also what has happened is a lot of the kids and teenagers that were involved, say, 10 years ago as kids, have grown up with the volunteer spirit inside of them because of the help they had when they were young and now grown up to be volunteers themselves. So a whole new crew of volunteers is being raised. Also, through, I guess, better publicity and, and more stuff, we've gotten more men involved, but, but our percentage of black men compared to the percentage of kids that we work with is still ridiculously low. And it's, you know, I question whether it's necessarily that black kids are in the biggest need or whether it's kids from low-income communities that are in the biggest need. But in Baton Rouge and in Louisiana, the majority of low-income kids happen to be black. And for kids who are being raised in public housing projects and who are being raised in these high crime areas where there are no male, inf positive male influences around or very few male influences around, these kids are going to maintain the same uh, same system that the parents did. They're going to stay in these ghettos, they're going to get drop out of school, and they're going to get into trouble. In that film, in that first part where, you know, the policemen were talking about their involvement with the kids, the real good that those policemen are doing are not that they are being coaches to these kids. The real thing is what each of them said at the end, that they are being that role model for that kid, and that kid is seeing a positive black man coming out, spending time with him, and giving that kid some positive direction and some positive hope. 
if if more people from in the middle class and upper class who have the the resources and the 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 outlook toward the future can get involved with these kids who are living in a hopeless kind of a situation then those kids will begin to change the way they think not because necessarily of what these people do with them but because that they take the time and they give the kid the hope and and more black men need to get involved as role models you know I'm gonna let someone else talk in a minute but <laughs> more you know recently we've heard some stuff about you know the need for, for role models in different positions particularly in the black community you know it doesn't have to be a kid doesn't care particularly if his senator or if his councilman is black what a kid cares about is whether the person who is spending time with him on a day-to-day -day basis what color he is he doesn't really care but he wants that man working with him on a day-to-day -day, regular basis as a positive role model we need more black and white role models working with kids on a day-to-day -day basis giving them that hope and that eye toward the future and I don't know if that answered your question but it certainly did. <laughs> Galen you're here not just because you're activities coordinator but you're a big buddy as well what can someone who volunteers to be a big buddy expect to uh, what, what can they expect out of the situation well, the first thing, when I first got my little buddy, um, I was excited. I was, uh, I had a lot of ideas of how I was going to change your life overnight. Um, but it's different. I mean, it's hard. It's hard work. But it's worth it. I mean, when the kid comes home with an A, when they're making Ds, it makes you feel good because you work with her. You know, that's a product of what I did. You know, when you visit the schools, when I visit her school, she's so surprised. She feels special because, you know, Hey, my big buddy came to see me. Somebody cares. You know, she, I see a, a more positive attitude in school. You know, I'm going to make A's. I'm going to make A's from now on, you know, when I get on her about her bad grades sometimes. So, I mean, I've gotten a lot out of it personally because I feel a, an accomplishment. You know, I've given somebody something they may have not otherwise had. If you were going to encourage uh, a man to become a big buddy or somehow to become involved with children, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? I tell them, well, remember all those things you didn't get to do when you were a kid, like maybe go to the circus or go skating or bowling. You can. This is a chance to do it without anybody really saying, God, he went to the circus <laughs> by himself. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I enjoy. You know, all the little childish things I may have done with my parents, but I mean, I enjoy doing them over and over again. So that's how I would encourage them. Project Literacy uh, U.S., the big PBS special, is in its, its last year, and their special earlier this week was on mentoring. When we set out to find uh, a mentoring program, really, Big Buddy was probably the most firmly entrenched, but there are some other things going on in this town and around the state, and that's why we have Janola Duke with us today. Janola, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the other mentoring-type programs that are already up and functioning, and about some of your plans for the future. All right. We don't, have not established a program defined exactly that way, but we've had a lot of people going into the schools working with children on a one-on-one -on -one or small group basis in what we call tutoring programs. And we've learned just what Jim has said, that what they do in tutoring is not nearly as important as the relationships. They offer the children the possibilities. I know one man told us one day, he was an engineer, and he said, you know, I really don't know if I'm doing any good. And we said, well, just for these children to have an opportunity to talk to an engineer is, opens possibilities that they have never known before. When we have our uh, evaluations at the end of the year and the tutors share their experiences, it's almost like a religious experience to hear what they say as they tell children's successes, that they've succeeded because they've been encouraged, they've had people to say to them, you can do it. And we've really had a, a growth of people working in the middle schools, and we're now going into the high schools in a, in a bigger way, where people can go in and work directly with children and be under the supervision of a teacher. The neat thing is the school day now starts so early, it starts about 7.30, so people could go before work or they could come on a lunch hour. People that were employed would be a, available to do that, and we're trying to really grow those programs. We would be very interested in starting a mentoring program. We had looked into a program called Youth Motivator, which is down in Florida, which is very much a similar program, a one-on-one -on -one relationship established through the school day. And people can work as little as a semester, coming a, once a week to visit with the child, or then they can go on and complete the year and do two semesters. So we're very interested in people being involved. I might add that when I first approached Janola to, uh, that we were 
and told her that we were interested in, in pursuing a program on mentoring relationships. She, she did steer us to the uh, Exxon program uh, where there are several uh, people, not just, just black men, but men, women, but we were able to talk to two black men who've been mentoring, one for three years and one for just about two. And uh, boy, they wouldn't have it any other way. Unfortunately, we couldn't invite him. We have a limitation on how many people we can sit on our set at one time, but uh, they are extremely enthusiastic. I think after after a year of going out there, and I think they only go maybe twice a week. One's in uh, distributive ed, uh, junior achievement, mm -hmm. and the other tutors. I think they they really uh, see the importance and feel the impact of of what they're doing. I mean, it shows in the faces of the kids that we saw them working with, uh, and these are slightly older children. Now, mm -hmm. what kind of program um, is feasible or in the works for? Uh, older children, say, in the high school years versus the elementary school years, which makes up the majority of Big Buddy, if I'm not mistaken. It does. We've also started a program for teenagers, ah. which really provides them as the mentors toward the younger kids. And it not only helps the younger kid, but again, it increases your self-esteem or the teenager's self-esteem when they take the responsibility for a younger kid. Just as Gay mentioned, you know, being a Big Buddy or being a volunteer in any of these organizations, you get just as much out of it as a kid. It's not a one-way street. It's a, it's a dynamic kind of a relationship, and that's really what it's all about. The, the people on the, who talked earlier, it's a dynamic relationship. It's not you just being this nice guy, but it's them also being nice to you, and it, and it works real well. Recently, some Exxon retirees recruited some more Exxon retirees to do this, and this is another wonderful place for people to work. Uh, with the new high school requirements, there are many things that children need help in that professional or retired people can help them with. Algebra is a great example. And I know you all have the power of algebra show, but there are lots of things <laughs> that need to be done in math. So there are many ways we can hook up people. Anybody that has something to offer, we'll find a place to put them. Okay. Galen, as activities coordinator, I have to get this in. Does this mean that you actually uh, coordinate uh, group activities or do you make suggestions for one-on-one -on -one how to get started with your with your little buddy? Okay, I actually coordinate group activities. Okay. Um, in addition to our one-on-one -on -one part of the program, we try to do group with many kids, like maybe 20 to 25 kids. Um, groups take them skating, might take them bowling, or I do like library trips and uh, crafts night and games night just to get the kids together so they're constantly seeing the um, positive role model. And that takes mm -hmm. some of the pressure off the big buddy too as, yeah. as far as thinking of things to do every every time they, they True. go to And a lot of the kids we do in group activities don't have big buddies yet. So um, that gives them a you know a way of getting to do some of the things the kids that do have big buddies I see. get to do. I see. Mm -hmm. Well I hope that uh, after viewing this that, that more people, especially black men, are encouraged to take on a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship, be it through Big Buddy or through uh, a corporate program. Uh, it, it is needed. I, had a, I have a, a friend that I met through doing the program who has six foster children. And uh, she said after the first one, she said, okay, this is it. I'm not going to, you know, one child is far is enough for a single parent. And uh, she went to see the second. And uh, when she took one look at the child and she said, oh, my goodness, she says, this child doesn't need me, I need her. And so it went with the next uh, four. And I think that's what happens to uh, all of us as we look into the situation. It's, it's not uh, them, we need them as, as well as them needing us. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next feature is an update of an old friend who is a role model for many young musicians. Alvin Batiste, jazz educator and musician, has returned to teaching after three years of retirement. At the end of the rhythm, I'll play the end of two, three, and four. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Um, da. Um, da. Um, da. Ah, ah, ah. Um, da. Okay. Alvin Batiste is back. After three years of retirement from teaching, the man who has trained and influenced some of the most brilliant classical and jazz musicians in the music world is back in the classroom at Southern University in Baton Rouge. Um, in 1986, I guess it was, um, by then I had three albums out. Um, we had grown uh, a whole generation of new musicians in New Orleans. The industry was responding to South Louisiana music uh, extensively. And I had a choice to make. 
uh, things weren't moving as fast as uh, they should have been, uh, according to my perspective, uh, at the university. And my career was moving very fast. And when, as you know, when the train starts moving, you have to catch it. So I caught it. <laughs> and um, since then, since I retired, I've done over six albums. I've been to Europe twice, been all over the United States. I uh, recorded with Freddie Hubbard. Um, I did an album with John Carter, Jimmy Hamilton, David Murray. Uh, I played Carnegie Hall. Uh, you know, it's just been, oh, I did a record, the last record I did was with Wynton Marcellus and three of my own students who are now with Wynton Marcellus. Baptiste's latest album, Bayou Magic, is getting rave reviews, due in no small part to his growth and maturity as an artist. Bayou Magic also marks the recorded debut of poet Edith Baptiste, Alvin's wife of 37 years. In terms of um, Al's music and my poetry, I, I really don't see a dichotomy. I really see it um, as interlacing. I uh, really s see the, the oneness in, in the two because I only look at um, the music in terms of, of harmony and melody, and I, I can see um, the poetry. Say, when you slow down the vibratory rate, then you get words. And so um, I think they, they are meshed. Alvin and Edith have three children and six grandchildren. Baptiste says that Edith has been a driving force in his development as a musician for over 40 years. When I met Edie, her daddy uh, had already, in a very successful way and, and on broad terms, provided an aesthetic environment for his children. And so uh, at, at Edie's house, you heard the violin, the cello, the bass, the clarinet, the trombone, the piano, and, uh, singing. And so I was able to continue even after I became interested and Edie uh, as a, a girlfriend, uh, my musical situation. Jazz music has been struggling for commercial success for many years. Part of the problem with selling jazz music has been the difficulty many people have in defining just what jazz music is all about. I'll never forget I was on, in a meeting with Al, and uh, this question came up, what is jazz? And my intuitive self immediately gave me the answer in terms of my personal quest. And it said that jazz is the justification of being, the ascension of the soul, the zest of the spirit, and the zeal of life. I tell uh, my students, or anyone who asks, technically, jazz is the art of using the intuitive mind to spontaneously or contemplatively, contemplatively compose music in the African-American style. When you approach it from that basis, then you're talking about the principles of African-American music. You're talking about all of the things that are, can be explained from a musical standpoint in terms of what people who organize our experiences in music call melody, rhythm, and harmony. And of course, the usage of these principles or these devices are, in Edith's style, uh, uh, these things that are actually carriers of human emotion, or human imagination, uh, human expression. Things are changing in the music world. Jazz is more commercially viable than ever. Many well-known jazz musicians cite the groundbreaking work of Baptiste and his contemporaries such as Ellis Marsalis as the reason for the popularity of jazz music today. Baptiste believes that education is the key to his and most other jazz musicians' success, and his priority is the training and encouragement of young minds. I have been furiously writing a book, Developing Children with Jazz, uh, to hope to contribute to some of the urban problems that we have in the school systems now because there, um, 
there is what I call a circle of consciousness that it's not an original idea, it's actually a consensus where uh, children are exposed to data and information and ways of looking at the world, ways of going about life from multiple sources, one of which is the school. Education, uh, in terms of the way that curricula are set up, has not drawn from these multiple sources uh, to use materials and techniques that would enable children with the kind of intelligence that they have, in spite of the fact that they may not be able to read or they may not be able to pass certain tests. And uh, I'm taking into consideration the intelligence that's imminent in most boys and girls, regardless of whether or not they can do the ABCs. And this intelligence is what enables them to option for the negative ways of conducting their lives that we're all concerned about. Well, we're out of time for today. Thanks for watching. See you next week on another edition of Folks. Bye-bye.